Hi there and welcome back. Now let's talk about why all this matters for climate, right? Why do we care about how the Earth orbits around the Sun? Why do we care that the Earth is a sphere? And why do we care about that tilt of the rotation axis? So um, the big picture idea really is that this thing, that tilted orbit of the Earth around the Sun, explains everything. It explains why we have seasons. Right? So changes in climate over time we call seasons. And you know, for us here in Massachusetts, the seasons are characterized by temperature changes, warm summers and cold winters. But the other thing that that explains is changes in climate as a function of space across the Earth, climate zones. So the take home message here is that climate is not arbitrary or crazy Right? Because of the tilted orbit of the Earth around the Sun and because the Earth is a sphere, right? where climate occurs is very much predictable. And how climate changes over time, <coughs> excuse me, over the course of the year is highly predictable. So, here's the take home message. Let's put this into uh, more scientific terms. The tilted orbit of the spherical Earth around the Sun determines the amount of solar energy that the Earth receives at a given latitude over the course of the year. In other words, it determines the climatic zones of the Earth and it determines the seasons. More specifically, the tilted orbit of the Earth around the Sun determines the length of day. And it's obvious if the day is longer, it's warmer because we get more sun. It also, and this is relevant, and we'll talk about this a lot, it determines what we call sun angle or angle of incidence. How high the sun rises in the sky over the course of the year. And then finally, that angle of the sun makes the sun hit the earth at more vertical or less vertical angles. And that has an impact on the intensity of the radiation. If you want to read up on that, that's pages 14 to 21, right? So it's a big deal. Now here's our concept map or flow chart, right? You have that as a handout, as a hard copy, and of course it's also on our course web page. Let's step through this. Right, we start at the top. Seasons are determined by the amount of sunlight, which result in temperature variations. That makes a lot of sense. The amount of sunlight in turn is determined by two factors. The length of day and the height of the sun above the horizon. That's the sun angle. Let's go left first. Amount of sunlight is determined by the length of day, which is longer in the summer. Check, we understand that. And let's follow this, is shorter in the winter. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Seasons, amount of sunlight, length of day, longer days in the summer, it's warmer, shorter days in the winter, it's colder. Now, let's take the other side here. Amount of sunlight is determined by height of sun above the horizon. That's that sun angle story. That sun angle is higher in the summer, and is lower in the winter. Okay, right? Ultimately, the height of the sun is determined by, we follow this, the tilt of the rotation axis. In the summer, northern hemisphere towards points towards the sun, right? Now, what about position and orbit? Position and orbit is relevant because that interacts with the tilt of the return, with the rotation axis. Right? So the length of the day is also determined by the position of the orbit, depending on whether or not the axis is pointing towards or away from the sun. Now, the variations in distance that the Earth has from the sun, or how elliptical the orbit is, really has completely neg negligible effects. The orbit of the Earth around the Sun is pretty much a circle. 
So it really makes no difference in terms of distance. So seasons are not caused by the Earth being closer to the Sun or farther away from the Sun. Seasons are caused by the orientation of the Earth relative to the Sun. And now I'm going to show you the most important graph in climatology. And once again, you have a handout for that. And it's also available online. Right. Now, this is a difficult graph. It's called daily receipt of insulation at the top of the atmosphere. So anytime you get a graph, especially a complex one such as this one, right, what you need to do is you have to pick it apart piece by piece. Complex figures, complex graphs, you can't just look at and immediately see what's going on, but rather you take them apart piece by piece. And then as you take them apart, I think, you'll be able to figure them out. So we'll start with the title. Every good graph has to have a title. Daily receipt of insulation at the top of the atmosphere. So that's the amount of heat, if you will, the units are watts per square meters, that arrive from the sun at the top of the atmosphere. All right, fine. So that's good. Now let's look at the axes. Let's start with the x-axis. On the x-axis here, we have, let's go back, um, the month, January, right, the 12th month of the year. Okay, fine. And that axis repeats itself at the top of the graph. Now, on the y-axis, we have degrees latitude. The equator of zero degrees is in the middle of the graph. And we're going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, right, towards the North Pole. And we're going also into the Southern Hemisphere to the South Pole. Right? And now what you can do is you can say, okay, let's assume I live on the equator. Let's assume I live in Quito, Ecuador. Let's assume I live in New York City. Or maybe I'm Santa Claus and I live at the North Pole. How much heat arrives from the sun in these particular locations over the course of the year? Well, let's have a look. Let's, for fun, assume we're living in Ecuador, right? And as you go through the year, you pick off, each time you cross one of those lines, you pick off that value and you graph it up here as an XY graph, right? On X, we have time, again, the month, and on Y now, we're plotting that insulation, that watts per square meters per day. And as you can see, at the equator, it really doesn't matter what day of the year it is there is pretty much constant amount of heat arriving from the sun at the equator. That's why there is no temperature change at the equator. It's always the same temperature. Let's look at New York City or Boston would work as well. So we start here, you know, January, and then we cross the 200 line, the 250, the 300, the 350, the 400, and so on. And we graph this here on our XY graph. So you can see that in January, only small amounts of insulation, small amounts of heat arrive from New York City. That number increases through the spring, peaks in the summer, and then drops back down again through the fall into the winter. That's why it's cold in the winter and warm in the summer. And then here, Santa Claus at the North Pole, it's the extreme situation, right? So if we start at the North Pole, right, those Darker shadings mean zero heat coming in, zero, 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 until you get to the March equinox. Now the amount of heat arriving at the North Pole is rapidly increasing. It's peaking at the June solstice and it's dropping off again at the September equinox. The sun disappears and there's no sunlight for the remainder of the winter. So on an XY graph, zero, 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 shooting up big time peaking on the June solstice and then dropping back down again. So for six months out of the year, the North Pole, is a, North Pole is a miserable place because it's dark. There's no sunlight getting to the North Pole. And of course, the inverse occurs at the South Pole, right? Because the seasons are simply reversed or offset by six months at the South Pole. So you can look at this graph, right? 
So that's the story of this graph. Now, we will review this graph. We will have an in-class exercise about this graph. We will work with this graph quite a lot. But this graph really tells you what the Earth has to work with in terms of heat from the sun. Now we can also do this differently. <clears throat> we can make a map. Now, this is a pretty funky map, so let's take this one. Let's pick apart this graphic piece by piece. Now we'll start here again, top of the atmosphere, net solar radiation. Okay, fine. That's that value we saw on the last graph, watts per square meters insulation. That's simply, you can call it the amount of heat that arrives from the sun at the top of the atmosphere of the Earth. Now here we're having a map. So we're not drawing it as an XY graph, we're drawing it as a map. So we see the continents here. This is North America, South America. We got Africa here, got Europe, <clears throat> got Australia over here, India. Asia, China, that sort of stuff, right? So let's just look at this part here. Um, and then in color, we have values, sort of the reds are the high values, decreasing into the oranges, into the yellows, and then further decreasing into the greens. So now you have a map of how much heat arrives at the top of the atmosphere from the sun. And you can see a very interesting pattern high values in the tropics. Lots of heat arriving from the sun in the tropics. Think of places like Cuba, think of places like Costa Rica, Mexico and Hawaii. They get a lot of heat from the sun. In contrast, the polar regions of the world, let's think Alaska for example, not a lot of heat arriving from the sun. Those are these yellows and greens, right, right in here. So these are values much, much lower. These are like maybe 100 versus 400. So there's about four times as much heat arriving in Hawaii, if you want to simplify it, compared to Alaska. Now, what is the problem with this? This is a simple map and a simple statement, but it has profound implications. Right? This is not a stable system. Yes, it's absolutely true that tropics receive far more energy from the sun than the mid-latitudes or the polar regions, right? So Hawaii gets far more heat from the sun than Massachusetts or Alaska. And that is not a stable system. We cannot have a situation where one part of the earth gets heated up a lot and another part of the Earth really doesn't get heated up that much. What has to happen now is an energy transport from the heat that gets into the tropics, that gets to Hawaii. That heat has to be distributed, has to be moved to Alaska, has to be moved to Massachusetts. There's simply too much heat in the tropics. There's too much heat from the sun arriving in the tropics. Hawaii is getting way too hot. Fortunately, there's these transport mechanisms that take that heat and spread it around the planet, spread it into the mid-latitudes and the polar regions of the northern hemisphere, but also, of course, spread it into the mid-latitudes and polar regions of the southern hemisphere. And the way we do this is through ocean currents and wind. So the fundamental reason why the wind is blowing outside today is shown on this particular map. That wind that's blowing outside, that ocean current, is moving excess heat from the tropics around the Earth, distributing around the Earth, so that places such as Alaska, so that places such as Massachusetts can actually be warmer than they otherwise would be. So that's a pretty cool story. We're moving around energy, we're moving around heat in the form of water, those would be ocean currents, and in the form of wind. So that's a pretty cool thing. So that's the fundamental story why we have wind. So this is a big deal, right? We started out with the definition or the differences between climate and weather. We looked at how the Earth orbits around the sun. 
we figured out that all that really controls the annual march of the seasons and the climate zones. And we've expanded this to look ahead and say, hey, because of all of this, we have to move heat from the tropics into the mid-latitudes and into the polar regions. And that gives us wind. All right? So that's the end of part three. Um, here's the handouts again. You have them on our course website. You also have a card copy of this. Remember, there's no class on Friday. We'll meet again on Monday and talk a bit more about the Earth and space. So thank you very much. Have a good weekend and see you next week.